middle slope, uh, close to Bageshwar area to Bageshwar area. So this landslide was caused because of the low erosion uh, of the river, and then the, it's a huge landslide. Uh, I mean, spanning over more than about 700, 750 meters. Now, based on the investigations, other thing that toe erosion has been stopped. Gradually, the landslide is getting stabilized in the recent times. This is the Uttarkashi landslide of October 2003. Uh, you can see three shoots coming down all the three directions, and the material coming down in all the three shoots uh, buried down huge number of uh, buildings and shops. Uh, even in, in 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 fact, on the right hand side, you know, there was a very huge. Uh, uh material dumping of material resulted in uh you know damaging of a number of shops houses and other things here getting buried in a very close up way now this is nanital nanital further down of Nainital, and the side slopes are uh you know eroded out to form a barren slope hill slopes and all that this is uh, along the Kaluding area. It's a major landslide that occurred. This is near Joshimat. Uh, yeah, this is another uh, two landslide which occurred close to Lakwa Dam. And this has been treated since then. I, I think this is uh, now it's not giving any major. But otherwise, it's uh, coming from a very steep slope. In Nainital, on the Sherkidanda Hill, the most problematic thing is the glide. Uh, you see the slow creeping. The slow creep movement of the slope always result uh, in the open cracks in the crown area. You can see the open cracks in the crown area. It's because the creeping movement. Now this is a creeping movement leading to cracks of the buildings that area. Now these are the various, uh, uh, you know, met, uh, met, uh, the stabilization measures which were introduced, which were rather installed in the hill slope. Uh, and uh, uh, University of Rukhi was uh, IIT was involved in this. So this is being is working for the last more than about 10 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, uh, Professor Anbalgan, sir, for your brief presentation. Yes, we can see in during the last years also and few years back also that so many landslides are happening in the hilly areas in the Himali, uh, <coughs> Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand and all. So I think the importance of these landslide standards which are mentioned by Professor Anbalgan are very important for the <coughs> criticality regarding the landslides. So <coughs> thank you very much, sir, once again. Uh, so now moving ahead with our session. Uh, I would now call uh, Dr. Prem Krishna for the next presentation. Uh, Dr. Prem Krishna had done his bachelor's and master's in structural engineering from the University of Roorkee in 1961. He had done his PhD from Imperial College London in 1964 and then he started his teaching. He is a leading person in the development of wind engineering in our country. He had served as the president of the International Association of Wind Engineering from 1991 to 1995, he took the initiative to organize the first Asia Pacific Symposium in on wind engineering at the University of Roorkee in 1985, which has since become a four yearly conference. At present, he is chairing the CED 57 committee on cyclone resistant structures to help in the development of wind related design codes. He has received the Lifetime Achievement Award in 2013 by the Indian Society of Wind Engineering, celebrating in 20 years of its establishment and the Distinguished Alumnus Award uh, from IIT Roorkee in 2012. So I would now invite Dr. Prem Krishna ji to present his presentation. Yeah, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chaudhary. <clears throat> yes, thank you for inviting me to this a uh, very interesting webinar, not only interesting, but I think a very useful webinar. The <clears throat> we've just heard two excellent presentations from uh, Professor CVR Murthy and Professor Anbalagan, very intensely uh, and very comprehensive ones. 
I now uh, share with you some thoughts about cyclone resistant uh, uh, design and construction. Well, as uh, uh, we are well aware, cyclones are one of the four very prominent natural hazards. Earthquakes, landslides, floods, and wind storms generally, and cyclones particularly, are uh, natural hazards, which we have to uh, safeguard against. The <clears throat> as we of course understand, natural natural hazards are not under our our control; they occur, and the engineer's mandate is. The safety of the installations and infrastructure against it in order to minimize life losses, property production, and thereby to reduce the disastrous consequences. And uh, indeed, as uh, Professor C. B. R. Murthy has said, life is the most important one, saving lives. As has been said, zero tolerance on the loss of life. So, uh, before uh, we, we uh, go further, I thought I'll talk a little bit about what cyclones are and what uh, kind of forces and effects that they uh, can cause. Now, uh, we all understand that wind flow generation is on account of atmospheric pressure differentials and temperature differentials, and it manifests itself into various kinds of storms, such as cyclones, the one we are addressing. Then there are the monsoonic and other inland storms, which are represented as boundary layer flows. Uh, there are other kinds of storms as well that occur. Tornadoes, thunders, uh, uh, downbursts, thunderstorms. But compared to cyclones, there are uh, these are very um, freak occurrences, very local, localized, very narrow band. Whereas a cyclone uh, covers a very huge area and carries very huge energies. So we uh, be mostly uh, face the brunt of wind storms in the country through local storms and dust storms and monsoonic storms. And on the coasts, we suffer from cyclones. More on the east coast, less on the west coast of the country. Although the, the cyclone activity on the west coast is also increasing in, in recent uh, years. So we have to be a little more careful when we talk about, uh, you know, the codification aspects. Now, whether uh, one kind of storm or another, there is something basic about uh, the, um, the character of wind. If one were to uh, take a trace of wind speeds with time, then this is the kind of trace that you will get. Random, dynamic, varying value of wind speed. And you can break it down into a mean value and a fluctuating part. This fluctuating part is called gustiness or turbulence in wind. As uh, 
very rightly pointed out in a slide by Professor Murthy, there is a difference between what occurs in the seismic, uh, when you have a seismic effect on the structure and when you have a wind effect. You can say wind in, a, in that sense is monotonic. You know, the structure, if it is a, the wind is blowing from left to right, the structure will deflect from left to right. And then that is where it will keep on fluctuating about a certain mean uh, position. Uh, also, wind velocity varies with height. This is one typical one variation in the boundary layer winds. And there is this fluctuating component which is riding that mean value. And uh, this, you notice, this fluctuating value is maximum near the ground and goes on reducing as you move uh, away from the ground. Uh, in, uh, with height, it goes on reducing. So there are some basic characteristics of wind which we need to remember when we uh, think of safeguarding against wind storms. The, as I've just mentioned, whatever the nature of the storm, wind is a dynamic complex phenomena which evokes a dynamic response from all over ground structures which obstruct its flow. The courts, however, mainly consider the boundary layer wind or the synoptic wind as the basis. Although some storm types which I mentioned, for example, a tornado, for example, a downburst or a thunderstorm have somewhat different characters, uh, different structure, I should say, compared to this boundary layer flow. But uh, we do not normally consider those uh, as being so relevant to our overall picture of uh, wind resistant uh, structures. Uh, some uh, course of practice are now beginning to recognize this difference in structure. Uh, perhaps, uh, for example, the Australian code, and I think maybe in time we will look at this as we go along. <laughs> Some picture of the storms. This is the cyclonic storm. You can see that picture taken. That's a thunderstorm and that's a tornado. Now, both the cyclone and the tornadoes. One very characteristic feature is that <clears throat> there is a circulatory motion involved. You, you can actually see this in this photograph, that there is a circulation, circulatory motion involved. So it is in the tornadoes as well. That there is a circulatory motion, there is an updraft, and there is a radial velocity. The more prominent part of uh, the wind uh, structure in a cyclone and even in a tornado is that tangential velocity, which can be very high, can be as high as 50, 60 meters per second. In tornadoes, even slightly higher values can be experienced. So it is that high velocity tangential component of wind that is important as far as cyclones are concerned. Apart from the fact that a cyclone can cover a very huge area. I'll show the, these uh, figures a little bit uh, in the next slides. Uh, <clears throat> cyclones are seasonal activities. In the northern hemisphere, they occur more, mostly between September to December. In the southern, one, they occur more between January and March. And this is the band within which most of the cyclones will occur. The worst affected is the cross-hatched portion, this one here. And we in India are placed here in this cross-hatched band of 5 to 30 degrees in the northern hemisphere and which as you know, most of our cyclones occur uh, between this period of September to October. In fact, 40, I've said here 45% occur uh, in uh, this cross-hatched part of the globe. 
Also, uh, we experience more cyclones on the eastern coast in this country as compared to the western coast. But as I mentioned, lately, in the last 10 years or so, we have noted increased cyclonic activity even in the west coast. And as I said, I think perhaps we have to take um, cognizance of that uh, fact. Earlier, we thought always, you know, the east coast is the one which is affected. Sometimes we get a cyclone on the Gujarat coast. That's what was the situation earlier. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, slide here tells us that this is the center of the uh, center about which the cyclone is having a rotational uh, motion and this is a silent uh, part of the cyclone. If you are placed here, you are very safe. But then the that tangential velocity goes on increasing and then tapers down. Now this extent from the center, as I said, can be up to even 600 kilometers, which shows the, you know, the extent of coverage. Then <clears throat> this part here, which is hashed, is the one in which you have very heavy rain uh, occurring along with uh, the wind. And also, there is a, uh, apart from the tangential velocity, there is an updraft component of wind within this shaded part here, which I've said here, A can be 20 to 30 kilometers, and B can be 30 to 50 kilometers. So within the 50 kilometers of the center of the cyclone, you can experience an updraft and heavy rain is expected. Apart from this, from the coast also occur, comes the uh, surge from the sea. And that surge from the sea and the heavy rain together can cause flooding in the region where the cyclone is occurring. The kind of speeds, extreme values given are here, you can experience up to 320 kilometers per hour of wind speeds. The torrential rain that I mentioned can be 180 centimeters per day up to that extent and the surges can be up to 14 meter high. Now, uh, you can imagine 14 meter high is like uh, almost a, a four-storied building. That's the height of the surge that comes to you from the sea and affects the coastal region. Fortunately for us, because of the topography at the coast, after a certain time, this surge goes on dying down. It doesn't carry on for very big stretches into the land. That is, a, unless it's a very flat land. But then what we are looking at is high velocities and flooding due to rain and surge. Those are the two factors which have to be taken care of in considering how to safeguard our uh, infrastructure in the cyclone affected zone. I'll skip this, not very important. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> over the years, strong measures and appropriate response have reduced losses to life, but losses to property and economy continue to be high and heavy. And uh, some of the uh, reasons I can think of why the losses of life have reduced is because of the uh, response and the evacuation that uh, can take place because of the warning time being sufficiently uh, sufficient uh, to evacuate people uh, because the, the, the structures and others in the coastal areas, much of, which, much of which are non-engineered, do uh, experience damage and uh, destruction. So, because of evacuation and taking place, place people to safer places, the loss of life has drastically reduced in the last few decades. But the loss to property and to uh, economy, to production and so on and so forth still continues to be very heavy. Uh, 
I suppose uh, some of the reasons you can think of is land use patterns of the affected regions. You know, we are still uh, heavily populated in those areas. We are also putting up industries. We are putting up uh, all kinds of infrastructure we are constructing. So we, uh, I can say we have more to lose if we use those uh, affected regions heavily. Then changes in environment are also causing a change in the pattern that you have in the natural hazards. Better standards of living, I suppose, uh, as far as the economy is concerned, if you have more, you uh, tend to lose more. So if we are richer, we lose more. If we are poorer, we lose less as far as the economy is concerned. So those are a few uh, thoughts I had that, you know, these may be the reasons why we are still continuing to have this uh, heavy losses in economy and uh, in even industrial production, agricultural produces and so on. Um, before I talk of this BIS uh, CD57, which is the cyclone resistant structures, and the scope is here, it has been already explained to you also by Mr. Arun Kumar. Uh, the mother code for wind loading is IS-875 part 3. That is the one which is mother code to even our CD57. So we must recognize that. Uh, because certain basic changes, if they occur in IS-875, they are equally applicable in whatever we do for CD57, which is specifically trying to focus on cyclonic uh, winds. Uh, but cyclonic wind is also wind. <laughs> Just, uh, so IS-875 uh, covers wind loading and it also covers uh, cyclonic uh, loading to that extent. So that connection we should never lose sight of. But uh, this CD57, the Cyclone Resistance Structures Code, uh, has been in, uh, uh, in existence for some time. And we have uh, formulated a few codes. I'll just explain to you what we have done. Uh, but before I go to that, as I said, let me also... Yeah, these are two codes that have been uh, formulated. This was early on. Guidelines for improving the cyclonic resistance of low-rise houses and other buildings and structures. Now, whereas whatever the code says is generally applicable to structures, the particular focus is on low-rise buildings and uh, which are constituting the major part of housing. And also, as Professor Murthy pointed out, not a big percentage of these is uh, engineered. These may be only semi-engineered or non-engineered buildings. So we thought, uh, you know, whereas whatever has been uh, given in this IS 15498, uh, generally applicable to uh, buildings and structures, it is focusing more on the uh, low-rise housing that uh, constitutes the majority of housing, as I said. Also, uh, re recent years, another code has been uh, formulated, and that is uh, design and construction of cyclone shelters. These are uh, guidelines given for design and construction, and uh, we thought it relevant because a very important part of the response for the event is to be able to evacuate uh, the population affected into safer areas. And one kind of safe area is the, is the cyclone shelter. There are other, uh, also, uh, other, uh, uh, you can say, uh, schools, buildings, and so on. They are also utilized. Sir, your voice is not audible, sir. Uh, okay, okay. Yes, yeah, sir. It came, came. I'm sorry. I had a 
this uh, my mobile <laughs> going meta so um, as i was saying this is we thought it is relevant to uh, draw up this guideline on shelters which we uh, have done recently <clears throat> now <clears throat> as i have just mentioned the uh, implications of cyclones the uh, infrastructure is affected in the cyclonic belt has to be safeguarded against the high wind velocity and the flooding that occurs due to heavy rain and surge so i just mentioned now design wind speed can vary according to geographical location average time chosen for averaging time chosen height above ground approach terrain topography directionality life and size of the structure and this is duly covered by the indian standard 875 part 3 the <clears throat> one deviation that i'll just explain uh, uh, were the basic wind speeds uh, for the country vary from 33 to 55 meters per second different areas experience different uh, uh, wind speeds and these are 3 second averages at 10 meter high above the ground and these are statistical uh, evaluations based on the meteorological data for wind that we have this also covers the cyclonic belts of the country however in the say, let me say almost 3 decades or so ago research at the scrc madras did indicate and this research was done on cyclonic wind speeds and this indicated that we expect in the cyclonic belt higher wind speeds and that is also there is evidence of it you you recall the odisha super cyclone where the wind speeds were into the 70s so this work on cyclonic wind speeds indicated that in the cyclonic belt even higher wind speeds can be expected so what explains the 50 meters per second which we have taken in the is 875 that is based on all winds wind storms all kinds of wind storms not only cyclonic wind storms so if you look at the cyclonic wind storms alone then you have a situation where you can expect higher wind speeds so then the question came how to take account of this higher wind speed and uh, for the cyclonic affected east coast and the gujarat coast uh, within 60 kilometers from the coast the basic wind speed was stipulated to be increased with the multiplier factor as per the indian standard 15498 uh, that i mentioned and uh, this is something like it's about 20 years old now and now also this is uh, reflected in the national building code the values that were taken as multiplying factors lifeline structures 1.30 industrial structures 1.15 and others 1.0 so no, no increase for others but for industrial structures particularly and for lifeline structures the multiplying factor taken uh, based on those uh, values of wind that we got uh, from the study uh, was 1.3 and 1.15 now obviously the philosophy here is that lifeline structures at no cost should be allowed to get affected in a, in a cyclone and that is understandable you know hospitals water towers tra transmission lines radio or television stations and structures of that kind they should not be allowed to get affected in any case otherwise the rescue and relief operation cannot proceed smoothly as far as industrial structures are concerned the argument was that we don't want them to get Uh, don't want them to get uh, destroyed uh, but part damage we may 
allow. And for other structures, again, uh, we are eating into the factor of safety, but not enough for them to get destroyed. So more damage we are allowing here. This is the philosophy with which this was done. Now also I may mention that uh, design information for various kinds of structures and particularly the pressure, uh, dis disposition of pressures on a structure of, and uh, structures of various kinds is reasonably well covered in the literature and of course in our standards, particularly the Indian standard at 75. And this is generally quite adequate for short and stocky structures. Uh, this, there is an exception to what I am saying. The exception is that where we deal with unusual geometries and situations not covered, such as interference from other structures in the vicinity. Now this design information that is given in the code, as I said, mostly gives you the coefficients of pressure and force. And this is assuming that a structure is uh, standing on its own. However, this is not the case uh, in, in practice. Mostly you have other structures around it. And this is what I am calling the interference from uh, structures in the vicinity. This has been uh, tackled to an extent in ISA 75. However, there is a need to revisit this. Uh, issue based on more experience in the last uh, many years since the ISA 75 part 3 was drafted. The other uh, issue that I am mentioning here is in the recent decades we have become much bolder in our architecture and uh, straight lines more or less have given way to cur curving lines and nonlinearity in, in, in uh, geometry. And uh, because of that, uh, a challenge is there for the wind engineer. You know, we need to find out in detail about the wind loading that occurs on those unusual uh, structures. The, uh, I think perhaps at this point we need to, uh, don't need to go into detail of, uh, you know, how we tackle this situation. But this is something which I need to point out that there is a need to continue to work in this area of finding out wind loading on structures for a couple of factors that I mentioned here. And this is equally applicable to cyclone effects, you know, like a cyclone also, as I said, causes wind only uh, as a one of the major uh, factors. Now, <clears throat> apart from the, as I said, the coefficient of pressure and force that you get from the Indian standard, I said 75 for many, many structures, the a realistic value of the velocity is very important. Since the forces that occur are proportional to the square of the velocity. Therefore, if we are making an error in our judgment to pick up the design wind velocity by even minus plus 10 percent, then the forces are wrong by minus plus 20 percent. So therefore, it is crucial that we are able to get the value of the design wind velocity as realistically as we can, as, as well as we can. Being a statistical issue, you can never be 100% sure that you got got to the design wind velocity, you know, with 100% surety. But what, I, what I'm saying is that you need to go on improving upon your database for getting to the right value of velocity for design, as, as good as you can. And continued research is required on for this. Now, considering that, uh, considering this, Recently, of course, 
the wind uh, map of the country has been altered, I think only a few years back. And uh, this is a, uh, the step in the right direction. Also, I pointed to certain factors uh, we are using for the cyclone affected regions. Now, a study has been uh, sponsored by the BIS on the recommendations of the CD57, an R&D project on the assessment of vulnerability of structures regard, in regard to wind, uh, cyclonic wind loads, uh, which was recommended by the CD57, is being pursued at IIT BHU. Now, mainly, what uh, I, the idea is to look at this factor, cyclonic factor, more closely. Uh, because as I said, this was assigned on the basis of whatever study and data we had about two decades ago. Surely more data has become available. Also, surely we've begun to understand things better than what we did maybe 20, 30 years ago. Maybe there is an improvement in algorithms that you use for trying to work out uh, wind velocities and so on and so forth. So with that in view, there is this study which is being pursued. And I hope that at the, it is about to be completed later this year. And I certainly have a fond hope that we will be able to perhaps refine this factor that we are taking so far in the IS uh, 15498 and also, as I said, it's part of the NBC now. Well, some pictures of uh, the kind of failures that occur in cyclones. As you see, these photographs are mainly buildings. Uh, this looks like there was some kind of a tank which is uh, buckled in due to wind, but they're mostly buildings. Failure of a tower in a cyclone, that was in the Andhra cyclone, 1977. Now, <clears throat> generally well-engineered buildings and structures do survive the cyclones, cyclonic storms. Uh, damage of failure of some of these cannot be ruled out but generally these survive. This can be for two reasons. One is that although we, it is an engineered building, we haven't quite gone as far as we should have in our design. Maybe there's some deficiency in design or construction. Or the nature stumps us. You know, we expected certain uh, level of wind speeds and the nature can always stump us. It can always come come in a more, uh, shall I say, stronger way uh, upon us and cause uh, damage or failure. But by and large, this is a good, you know, this statement is correct that most engineers buildings in the past have been surviving cyclones. The uh, damage uh, that has been noted in some engineered buildings is more to the envelope than the framework of the building itself. This could be due to poor design of the cladding to withstand high wind or the wind borne debris damaging the envelope. There can be two reasons one can think of why the envelope suffers. Now, of course, once the envelope suffers, the frame may stand, but the building has become uh, unusable. Once the, uh, yeah, there's some photographs, some uh, CBRI, Turkey did a site study after uh, the cyclone in 2019. And uh, you can see the envelope of failure here. The glass pane has broken. And if you have such openings and the cyclone is blowing, then you can understand that the people inside 
the building are in great trouble. They can get hurt. Of course, the things will get damaged and so on and so forth. As I, as I said, by and large, the building becomes unusable uh, for all practical purposes. Now, considering this, we uh, in the CD 57 have uh, drafted two uh, codes. One is a draft Indian standard method for determination of performance relating to safety of external building fabric impacted by wind-borne debris. So this is one which uh, is in the advanced stage. It's, uh, I think, about to get uh, printed shortly. And another one that is being drafted is on the facades. What do we, what can we do so that we do not get the envelope failures? And I think the issue there is uh, of connections. How do you connect your uh, cladding to the framework? That's the very important part. And we are focusing on that part in this particular standard. Because I understand there is a, a standard on glazing, which is available. And uh, here our focus has been on how to uh, make proper connections so that failures of the envelope do not occur of the kind that you have just noted in the photographs. How many minutes do I have? Uh, maybe can I take three or four minutes and... Yeah, three, four, three, fine. Three, sir. four, fine. fine sir. Yes, I think I have spoken for enough time. Okay, then uh, uh, I have mentioned this before, I need not spend more time on this. There are two uh, drafts which are reasonably in ad advanced stage again. Uh, one is a new draft for explanatory, it's an explanatory handbook, including the consideration given in 15498 guidelines for low-rise buildings. So this handbook is expected to, uh, you know, help people adopt whatever stipulations we are making in the IS-4498, 5498, more, you know, in a, in a better manner. It's an implementation issue, I think, with, with that in interest, this uh, explanatory handbook is being uh, made. And then uh, there's another draft which is uh, being prepared, and that's guidelines for action required after cyclone warning is received for protecting the habitat. And that is uh, by the, the inhabitants. This action is required by the inhabitants, not by the authorities or uh, the rescue people. This is something, you know, if you get about 48 hours advance notice, then there are few steps that you can take yourself for safeguarding your building or reducing the possibilities of damage in your building. So those are two other new drafts which are being, uh, uh, they have been um, already drafted and they are in an advanced stage. And as Mr. Pant was saying, you know, we, will, we are likely to see a lot of activity this year in, uh, in in quotes uh, or standards or guidelines being prepared related to hazards. So I think I'll stop at this point and uh, uh, I hope that I've been able to uh, give you enough information about what we are doing in CED 57 and also a little bit about cyclones, what they are and what they do. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Dr. Prem Krishna, sir. Uh, it was a very informative session. Uh, thank you for the brief presentation given by you. Uh, as sir has already elaborated and detailed regarding all the aspects, and he has all elaborated all the very points regarding the cyclone resistant design in a very simple manner. I hope it will be beneficial for all of us. So uh, I can see a few comments in the chat box. We will take up the comments in the bus, uh, last session at the end of the session. Okay, so moving ahead with our uh, last presentation for the today's webinar, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Santosh S. Vajik Saab, uh, he had done his fire engineering from the National Fire Service College, Nagpur, 
is also MBA in finance and law. He has got over 30 years of wide experience in the field of fire prevention, protection and operational side. At present, he is serving as the chief fire officer and fire advisor of MIDC Fire Service and of course, the director of Maharashtra Fire Services. So, Dr. Uh, Varik Saab, uh, over to you, sir. Please. Thank you very much uh, for giving me opportunity for today's presentation. Uh, Thank you. Fire is a very common disaster what we see in urbanized and industrial occupancies across the nation. And we means equally have uh, fatalities and uh, property loss due to fires. So as far as National Building Code Part 4 is concerned, it's related to the fire and life safety of any building envelope. So we wanted to make sure that the fire and life safety should be ensured in any type of occupancies that we are using right from residential purposes, business purposes, industrial purposes and other activities. So as far as the safety is concerned, safe built envelope, envelope is specified in National Building Code recent uh, edition 2016, in which the structural safety, health safety, fire safety, constructional safety, electrical safety, uh, environment safety, life safety and public safety are addressed in various parts of National Building Code. So as far as the point uh, part four is concerned, it is related to fire, smoke and uh, uh, fumes, depending upon what activity is carried out within the building, the buildings are classified into nine classes and on that basis, uh, the minimum fire protection requirement is specified in table seven of part four of National Building Code. Based upon the potential risk of the building, they are classified into residential, educational, institutional, assembly, business building, mercantile building, industrial building, storage, and the hazardous activities building. So right from fire extinguisher to hydrants, sprinklers, smoke detection system, the pumping requirement at what uh, means at the ground level, the quantity of water, all these specified uh, based upon the type of hazards of the building in table seven of National Building Code part four. So as far as the structural safety is concerned, there are three parameters which are very important from the safety of the building. One is the load bearing capacity, that is the stability of the building. Anything goes wrong, fire or explosion in the building, the building should remain intact so that it should give some time uh, availability for the carrying out evacuation of the occupant. Also for the firefighters who are entering into building, for them also it should be a safe envelope for doing carry, uh, carrying out firefighting and rescue operation. Second is the integrity of the building, how the flame spreads from one compartment to another compartment or adjoining part of the building. Then the insulation, the temperature transfer from one compartment to another compartment. This figure uh, diagram will show this first is the loading capacity, load bearing capacity of the building. building. It is called as the stability. Second is the integrity, the flame, with the penetration from the one building to another building, how it is allowing to uh, spread the flame. And third is insulation, the temperature ones. So these three factors are very important for the stability of building. And on the same basis, the buildings are uh, in the fire prevention part of part four. They have classified the buildings on these parameters, the fire resistance of the material, the smoke and preventing the smoke and fumes from one compartment to another. The total considering the fire load structures, certain types of constructions are allowed in particular for the high rise building and uh, uh, for the uh, low rise building having high hazard, the only type one and type two type of uh, constructions are allowed. So this classification is provided as per the clause 3.3.1 of uh, NBC part four. The type one construction is four hours fire rated, type two construction is three hours fire rated, uh, type three construction is of two hours and type four is of one hour fire resistance. Table one gives more clarity about the different types of construction and where you have to have 
how much type of a fire resistance uh, to that particular activity. So it is very specified if you are dealing with the high rise building and the high hazard industrial activities, the only type one construction is uh, and type two construction is allowed. You can see the external walls here, the load bearing capacities, depending upon the separation 3.7 meters or 3.7 9 meters, it is 240 meters or 120 meters uh, or 90, 90 minutes uh, fire resistance is required. So uh, you will see minimum one hour to two hours fire ratings are recommended in type one and type two construction, depending upon the potential risk of the building. Then uh, there are external uh, facade uh, fire resistance is re uh, required, separation of shafts within the buildings, the compartmentation area. So all these are specified as a 120 minutes uh, internal uh, uh, means uh, compartmentations considering the fire uh, loads. So fire resistance material, if it is a complete burnout is uh, to be prevented in case of fire and explosion. So to make the building more safe, we have to use the proper fire resistance material because we have uh, in the construction industries, different types of materials are available for the use. Maybe glass, maybe steel, maybe uh, RCC or brick or stone, whatever it may be. But depending upon the how much load it can carry in case of fire, based upon that, that material should be utilized uh, by the developer or the architect should plan in advance what type of a potential risk is to be uh, there in the building. Based upon that, the material should be utilized. So there are some uh, services which are going on. Also, we have to protect those services from the fire and they can uh, be used as a means they can be instrumental for spreading the fire from one corner to the another so maybe electrical installation air conditioning smoke vent heating surface spread of different materials glazing glass facades external walls so these are the things that also we have to uh, consider while framing the uh, framing the building so as far as glass facade is concerned the part uh, means of nbc part 6 that structural design and uh, section eight, which gives more details about the glazing uh, protection. As far as fire protection is concerned, if you have the glass facade, then you have to seal the gaps between the slabs and the glass facade. And you have to have the window sprinklers or you can have the regular sprinklers at the distance of 600 mm from glass facade to cool that glass in case of fire. So as far another feature is of compartmentation, which is very important uh, from the fire and life safety point of view. The compartmentation is a two hours fire rating uh, envelope within the building, which will have the enclosure with the fire doors so that no heat and smoke can travel from one compartment to another compartment vertically or horizontally. So with the sprinkler, if you are utilizing the basement car parking can be up to 3000 square meters. Basement use for the other activities can be restricted up to 200, uh, 2000 square meters. For the institutional building, it is 1800 square meters with sprinkler. Uh, then uh, other mercantile building, 2000 square meters, business building, 3000 square meters. And for the general other buildings, it is 750 square meters. Uh, if uh, as a compartmentation, you can take for the uh, protection of the building. So this is a simple diagram wherein the, there is a one compartment is there where is fire has occurred and in that compartment, the both the slab bottom and above, they are fire rated. Again, the fire resistance wall is there and fire door is there. So that anything goes wrong over here, automatically smoke detection will detect, it will give alarm for the occupants for evacuating the building and the sprinklers will come in action and to control the fire and immediately response will be generated either within the building or the fire services to control this fire in case of emergency. So if the proper compartmentation is not done, the scenario will be like this. The fire will be spread from one compartment to another compartment through the false ceiling or through the different services. They are crossing from one compartment to another compartment, maybe electrical ducts, ventilation ducts or air conditioning ducts. Uh, that may lead the fire from originally. Uh, this is the compartment where it is origin, and now it is spreading through the false ceiling to the adjoining compartment. 
so these are the normal practices what is recommended as per the national building code to follow in the building that may be uh, various services going through that should be protected with the fire retardant uh, uh, enclosures then the smoke extraction systems to remove the uh, uh, smoke from the building the smoke is a major killer uh, as far as life safety is concerned uh, the direct fire is not killing uh, the occupants but the smoke is toxic smoke is a major uh, component for the fatalities then the smoke barriers to protect the access or the staircases or the lift lobbies then the steel protection if it is a building is of steel then the, it should be protected with the uh, proper fire retardant barriers or the fire paint so that uh, the, it should not buckle down. Then the preventive seals passing through horizontal and vertical uh, uh, means uh, compartmentation. Then fire dampers, then ventilation uh, duct protection. So these are the various methods of passive fire protection recommended in National Building Code Part 4 for uh, limiting the spread of fire and smoke and heat from one compartment to another compartment. This is the ideal example provided in part four of National Building Code. Horizontal evacuation in case of hospitals. Already uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Panji has highlighted it. So in case of hospital, these are the two fire doors given and this line is cross, mean separating the floor into two compartments, compartment A and compartment B. And in case of fire in compartment A, addition to the compartment B, so that uh, these fire wall and the fire door having the two over fire resistance can take care and smoke will penetrate into compartment B uh, through these doors. And we can uh, means uh, take the patient to this compartment safely and we can give them the whatever the means emergency uh, medication or the life support systems they require through this uh, uh, compartmentation. So this is the ideal design for the hospital buildings, what is recommended in National Building Code. And it is having all the, means every compartment has a fire escape staircase and the fire lift for the carrying out any evacuation. Another, uh, if, uh, this compartmentation is given, the corridor has divided into two compartments with the two hours fire resistance and the different types of uh, staircases you can see this is the central uh, staircase this is the external staircase can be considered as a fire escape staircase and in uh, after utilizing this staircase if you are coming down to the ultimate safety the exit discharge how it should be that also recommended at ground level this for this internal staircase two hours fire resistance passage is created and through that a discharge is given. It is not passing through any other activities at ground level. So such kind of a, uh, enclosures will give more uh, safety to the occupants for leading to the ultimate safety. This is uh, again example of dead end corridor. This is the dead end corridor. If you are leading to this dead end, there is no exit available. So exit is available only this area. So in case of hospital and educational buildings, we are recommending only six meters travel distance. And in case of other buildings, the half the travel distance, if it is a 30 meters, then it dead end should be 15 meters. It should not be more than 15 meters that traveling, going to the dead end and coming back to this staircase. So such type of a distance dead end is uh, recommended to be maintained as a half the travel distance. This is a very good example for the high rise building specifically mentioned in National Building Code Part 4, which is called as a firefighting shaft or fire tower. This is comprising of an external staircase with fire door and a fire lift. Uh, it is also protected. The lobby is protected with again a fire door and a communication device uh, and a wet riser come down comer uh, with the uh, hose and all that. So this is the enclosed, uh, enclosed type of a uh, tower available for the firefighters to reach on the upper floor in case of emergency. They can utilize this. This is provided with the separate electrical backup system so that the firefighters can use this lift for going on the upper floor uh, to minimize the response time. Also, this lift can be utilized for the guided rescue of the occupants if the occupants are physically challenged or old uh, people are there. So we can utilize this lift uh, for the carrying out of evacuation. And entire both this staircase and this lift lobby is pressurized so that no heat and smoke will enter into this uh, uh, 
uh, tower. So this is a really useful uh, uh, requirement uh, specified in National Building Code Part 4 and at the design or the planning stage, every architect and civil engineer should ensure that such type of a tower is provided for the high rise building, uh, which will be really helpful for saving precious human life. This is a common example of a fire tower. This is staircase, lift lobby, and it is enclosure type. This is again a recommendation. If you have the openings of fire tower, you're taking light and ventilation from fire tower, then in that case, at least three meters, you should have the blank wall so that no heat and smoke should come out of this blank wall and penetrate into a fire tower. So this is the additional uh, recommendations given in part four of National Building Code. This is similarly, if it is a dead wall for the fire tower, then you can have the opening. Uh, it is a uh, vice versa. So fire stoppings are really available for two hours fire rating as for the compartmentation purposes. The fire barriers and uh, means, uh, there are different products are available in the market and you have to utilize it, uh, ensuring that uh, though there will be no spread of uh, heat and smoke from one compartment to another compartment. So this is the again a diagram wherein the walls, side walls, fire door is there, uh, compartmentation wall is there of two hours, fire rating ceiling member is there and above that there are number of services going off, maybe electrical ducts, ventilation ducts and other services are passing through and they are protected with the fire rated ceiling. So these are the products which are available if the ducts are provided for the electrical ones, plumbing ones or firefighting ones in the building uh, or other services that should be properly sealed so that in case of fire, no heat and smoke can communicate with the horizontal upper uh, floors. This is again an example for the uh, duct sealing. The, uh, the inspection doors also should be have the fire rating. The refuge area, it is uh, for the high rise building about 24 meters and after every 15 meters, the provision of 15 square meter minimum or the 0.3 per uh, m square per person should be provided on the external side of the building so that the external rescue of the uh, people can be possible with the help of aerial ladder platform or turntable ladders available with the uh, municipal fire services or the uh, state fire services. The steel protection is again an important one for industrial or warehousing steel uh, pro uh, structures are utilized and in case of emergency, in case of fire, there is a possibility that the entire structure can buckle down. So to avoid that, <clears throat> you should have the proper uh, means uh, sealing of the or protection to the steel members so that they will not uh, buckle down. So this is the example how the due to heat uh, the steel will lose its uh, stability and the building can collapse. So to avoid that, the proper ceiling or proper protection should be there. So that can be covered with the help of the gypsum board or for RCC cladding you can view or gypsum cladding you can consider uh, different types of materials, fire resistance materials are available in the market so you can properly utilize them. So this is an example of uh, steel protection, steel I I beam is there and it is covered with the uh, gypsum protection. So this is also example of gypsum protection. Steel buckling. The, another <coughs> important aspect is the exposure hazard. Anything goes wrong in any building, the adjoining building uh, gets affected due to the fire or explosion. So there should be a safe distances that is a real, uh, means coming through the part three of national building code that is the development control rules or building bylaws uh, from which the distances are created with the help of uh, this we can increase the distance between two buildings and depending upon the potential risk of the building and based upon the height of the building the minimum distances are specified in part three of national building code and if you uh, if we maintain that uh, the falling object due to fire and explosion can fall within the open spaces or the distance between the two, two buildings. And this space can be utilized by the fire services for carrying out external firefighting and rescue operation also. So this is the example how the fire or explosion can occur and it may lead to the damages to the adjoining building and how to control uh, this by keeping the proper distances between the 
two buildings. This is again a exposure hazard uh, diagram. So circulation of uh, fire appliances around the building. This is also very important. A minimum six meters uh, uh, means road, and with nine meters turning is recommended for all high-rise buildings as per the National Building Code Part Four, so that uh, that there is a distance created between the both the buildings, and also for the uh, to provide the space for the fire appliances to move around the building. So the, uh, the implementation of part four of national building code is very much important as far as the international practice is concerned, uh, as uh, the focus is moving from the active to passive fire protection from the planning stage of the building itself. The all stakeholders, maybe uh, the planners, developers, architects, civil engineers, structural engineers, uh, HVAC consultant, electrical consultant, fire consultant should speak to each other and they should provide all their inputs at the discussion table at the initial level uh, itself so that the proper implementation of various uh, standards uh, bureau of indian standard has various uh, national building code if implemented definitely it will uh, save the precious human life and property so uh, as we said to prevention is always better than cure if you start the discussion at the initial stage Definitely, it will help us uh, to save the life and property. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Arif Saab, for your brief presentation. Arif Saab has already mentioned about the fire preventive measures, fire safety, firefighting equipments. As we all know that uh, fire incidents are occurring so frequently in our uh, country. So all the fire provisions which are mentioned by Varik Saab, they are already there in the our national building code also. So <clears throat> that will be very uh, essential in the case of firefighting. So thank you so much, Varik Saab, and all the speakers' presentations uh, very well. They have explained about all the four topics in a very simple and informative manner. I thank you all for your brief uh, presentation and deliberations. So we would now uh, begin with our question and answer session. We will take up a few questions one by one. Uh, we can uh, also give the option to the yeah. presenters themselves. Yeah. Uh, they can identify the important questions which they can take up first. For example, uh, we started uh, with Professor Murthy sir. Maybe we can give him a little more time. Uh, to Varit sir, uh, there were two questions. For example, one from Charulata ji. Ji. Fire resistance rating for structural steel for ceiling and roof requirement. Where are they given in NBC? They are asking. Charlotte It is basically table number one. It is material independent. All right. Kindly elaborate on it further, sir. On the chat towards the end. At 1247 is the query from Charlotte Ji who has mentioned about fire resistance rating. So the table one, if somebody sees, it is irrespective of the material used. It the code wants such elements to have a necessary of the X minutes of fire resistance depending on type one, type two, type three, or type four. There is an annexure number C which talks about what is the experimentally proven value of fire resistance rating for different building elements like masonry element, concrete beam, concrete slab, steel encased with uh, your gypsum plaster board, etc., etc. Those are given at annexure C. And uh, there is another question from Mr. Satish Yadav regarding clause 3.3.1 for which our uh, former uh, director of Delhi Fire Services, Dr. Girichandra Mesha, has also replied earlier, basically type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4 construction in part 4 is to help or enable the planners to design, uh, to uh, ensure that where are the fire zones in a uh, city which has to be planned, which are the permitted uh, occupancies in that area, given that if the road width has been defined, depending on the width of the road, then the type of construction, uh, I mean the floor area ratio for that particular road has to be technically assigned. For that information, this table on uh, this particular table on FIR has been given both in part three of the National Building Code 
and in part four it is not directly relevant to the architects directly but it it enables the planners to uh, give that value uh Vanisha, would you like to add more on this no absolutely depending upon the road width approach and already nbc has specified uh means while granting additional fsi what uh, consideration you should have that leads to the capacity of the local fire services for doing firefighting and rescue operation, water supply, parking availabilities, the road width, the marginal open spaces. So these all parameters are already specified in part three and part four of national building code. Based upon that, they can increase the FSI right from one to up to four. Now uh, they are giving and some uh, states they are allowing up to uh, six also. So it depends upon the local need of the development. So such type of uh, uh, FSIs can be granted. But uh, it means you have to look at the recommendation from part four and there are respective IS standards are there. So you have to look, uh, look into that also depending upon the how much fire resistance uh, tests are there. So you have to select the product which is properly tested by the some test lab, accredited test lab either internationally or the nationally, then only you can ensure that uh, that much fire resistance can be achieved. Thank you, Varik, sir. Uh, if I can request Professor Murthy uh, to pick uh, whatever uh, important questions which he feel. Okay. Uh, thank you, Arun. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'll run a quick answer for uh, the long questions. Uh, yeah. Is there any way local bodies uh, follow BIS code of practice uh, for safe structures. Um, we are hoping that eventually a techno legal regime will come and then that will insist that the local bodies are able to check the safety of the structures and their own offices instead of trusting uh, the designer alone. What are Adobe buildings? They are made of mud, not burnt mud, but plain mud. Right. Lightweight structures, all earthquake resistant structures should be lightweight. So there is no category of lightweight structures at all. How about shell and spatial structures? Shell structures and spatial structures, when you put them through cyclic loading, thin members may not be able to withstand the, um, the extreme actions during earthquake shaking. So usually you will not see shell structures uh, being used in seismic areas. Of course, if you take the shell structure thickness to 300 mm, 500 mm, yes, you can be, um, you can try and uh, do the calculation, but in general, observe that shell structures may not be able to perform well. Uh, existing building checking and recommendation uh, and retrofit are included yes. in the new code provisions. Yes, they will be included in the new code provisions. Are there any um, uh, Reinforcements other than FRP and bamboo, we are not discussing reinforcement in this uh, presentation, so we'll not touch that. Uh, will fracture mechanics concept be included in the future design codes? Uh, fracture is the initial part of it. We are worried about collapse. So fracture is not so much a worry for us. Collapse is our big, uh, you know, thunder. So uh, fracture to avoid fracture, they are doing uh, localized additional materials like fibers and so on to delay cracking. But in earthquake resistant design, cracking is not so much of an issue as much as is stopping collapse to begin with as of now in India. Eventually, when we stop collapse, then we can worry about cracking also at some point of time later on. There was one query on uh, IRC codes. Yeah, I'm coming to that. There is uh, IRC, where is that one? Ah, that's the last one, yeah. So 1893 part three for bridges, which bridges come under this category? It so happens that we have divided the territory. It's uh, all the railway bridges will be done by IRS. All the highway bridges will be done by IRC compulsory. Right. Now, where are the remaining bridges? There are uh, on private property, if you are building bridges, which carry loads other than, uh, you know, um, vehicular loads, vehicular means say the railway or uh, roadway, mm -hmm. then uh, of course you can use this as a bridge design uh, code. But more importantly for me, uh, the BIS bridge code should be a model code for IRS and IRC to push their barriers up. 
to push their uh, performance up. So we are hoping that our comprehensive revision of the bridge code will eventually get to that point. Talk about base isolation of bridges and so on also as part of that. Uh, there is one last question from somebody. Ah, 1890 part four says that uh, uh, all in all categories, in all zones, so the P delta effect should be considered. Um, mm. This needs further deliberation, clarity on importance of building. Industrial structures are all important. So mm. all of them, we need to do P delta effect. So there is no negotiation here. There are absolutely important structures. So we will ask all industrial structures, whatever category within the industrial structures you want to state, they are all important for us. So P delta is a serious matter. The masses are very heavy and the supporting systems can be slender. So you might have large deflections. And so overturning effects have to be considered. Secondary effects have to be considered. In that. I'll stop here and then see other colleagues may have questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Moti, sir. Uh, if I can request uh, Professor Anbaragan ji regarding one query from Sri Manoj Kamradi. Advanced warning technique for landslide prediction. Could you please uh, share in the public interest? That is his request. Yeah, this is uh, actually one of the most wanted <laughs> topic. Actually, many people are trying to uh, you know achieve perfection in this. Uh, unfortunately, in India, uh, I mean, we have been trying in two places in Amr Amrita University. DST tried. Uh, uh, you know, to make some sort of uh, advanced warning. Uh, even even in Haridwar, uh, they try to set up uh, certain equipments in advanced warning. See, when, when we go for advanced warning means, so there are two parameters. One is the surficial movement. Another is the changes in the subsurface characteristics. For example, if there is a water recharging, so the pore water pressure increases below. So that has to be monitored. How this affects the surficial uh, you know the changes that the both the things are to be studied and put together for uh, early warning system so i think it's a very huge amount of uh, instrumentation has to be done uh, in this i would uh, uh, mention there are two uh, countries where they are, they are doing in a very highly advanced way one is hong kong in hong kong the slopes are you know very less amount of, amount of slopes are available and it's very highly urbanized now, even the slightest, you know, movement in one place, it will seriously, periodically affect the slopes further down. A number of houses will be subsequently down, down and down, it will be affected. So the, the, the administration cannot afford to, you know, happen this. So what they have done is the entire uh, Hong Kong area, they have, uh, they are monitoring, closely monitoring with uh, extensometers, piezometers, and also inclinometers. In addition, they are also monitoring the surficial movement also with the help of, uh, uh, you see, the remote sensing. So this is uh, any, even the slightest changes in the surface character or surface movement, surficial movements can be detected. So, and, 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 and the warnings also, you know, warning in the form of a bell ringing in the nearest, uh, you know, control tower. So will be there. So people will immediately where the problem is there, they will try to rush there and then they try to find how best they can take care of that. That is impossible. So I've seen myself in Australia, in Wollongong area, uh, there was a railway station which is coming. Just by the railway station, uh, there is a very major landslide, which is generally active during rains. So what they've done, they put uh, a uh, number of uh, subsurface uh, monitoring equipment, surficial monitoring equipment, the same one. Uh, they put mainly extensometers and then the piezometers, and we, they are connected to the warning system. And the moment the piezometers exceed that threshold value, so it uh, rings a bell, and the ring, the bell in the railway station as well as the police station nearby, it rings, and then immediately they rush and they stop the train and all that. They take care of all that. So this type of thing in India, I think probably we are yet to take take off with this venture. I think we need to have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, um, research and development, and then we may have to think about going for it. It's very good. It's one area where it's a gray area where a lot of work has to be done. Thank you.
Thank you, Thank you sir. If you can request uh, Professor Prem Krishna ji about one query from uh, Mr. Swastik regarding wind speed multiplication factor for industrial structures, which is given as 1.15. Is there any distinction between hazardous and non hazardous industries? Uh, not that it is specified as. Uh, we have not distinguished between the two. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mm. In the meantime, there were uh, some queries about uh, what about shell and spatial structures. I would like to mention that CED 38 Special Structures Sectional Committee has got separate Indian standards on bins, silos, folded plates, etc. There are uh, some of these standards, including on uh, concrete chimneys, are also covered. This is for your information. And uh, there's another qu uh, question from Dr. Rahima Shabin regarding uh, any standard on other than steel reinforcement, for example, bamboo in reinforcement and FRP in re as reinforcement. Regarding bamboo as reinforcement, the National Building Code already is permitting in its part 6, section 3B on bamboo. If you can uh, kindly go through that particular chapter, you will get further information. Regarding FRP bars, I would like to mention that CD 54 Concrete Reinforcement Sectional Committee has taken up a new standard which has come up for the working draft document is already completed. Once the technical committee evaluates it, it will then come up for uh, public comments uh, in the as in the form of a wide circulation draft. This is for your uh, information. And one Mr. Tom Damien has uh, mentioned about the sewage related structures yes. and the sewage network it itself is a large uh, infrastructure and the acid exposure is not given relevance that is uh, his point won't this lead to sewer collapse and subsidence of uh, other structures over it kindly correct if it's wrong uh, whether the exposure clause in 4 by 6 deals with this sewer exposure or not that is uh, his query uh, here are two things sir, I would like to mention here, sir. If it is made of a concrete pipe, then definitely the provisions of 456 will be applicable. If it is made of other types of material, there is always an option, even the code bonds, that uh, anybody who is uh, putting his sewage into the sewage network, he has to do some sort of initial treatment. I mean, only for the industrial, uh, like large scale wall volume generation of sewage. But for the purpose of assets which are generated all along the network itself, for that reason only, there are specific standards uh, which talk about uh, acid resistant, use of acid resistant bricks, etc. And there are fewer new cement types uh, which can be used in the concrete making also, which such type of pipes, if used, they will have a defined uh, life of that particular sewage network also. If Professor Moti or somebody... Madam, there are two questions here. Uh, yes, sir. One is uh, traditional blending with earthquake resistant feature. Is it possible to be designed for mountain region in place of RC structures? Answer is yes. Wisdom of 1000 years is much better than wisdom of 50, 60 years. So we strongly recommend use of traditional construction. But in some limited uh, cases, uh, you will be required to do concrete constructions also. Those have to be done as per the standard, uh, keeping in um, mind all the precautions that are suggested. Second is engineered timber is suitable material which can be used for construction. It will be part of 1893. It will become part of 1893 if there's a formal research program that tells us the behavior of timber and so that we can propose formal clauses for that. Uh, there's a question, half question, are basement stop stories um, soft story, whether you hide it anywhere in the building, it is a soft story. And earthquake is very smart, it will catch it, whether you hide it in the basement or show it on ground. So it's, uh, what is bad is bad is bad. There's no doubt about that. Right. Yeah. About that, is to request code committee to provide supplementary guideline with example for non-linal analysis for upcoming 1893, so that all across the industry, it may be successfully implemented. Uh, BIS should not do this. Actually, the educational institute should touch, uh, teach nonlinear analysis and first prepare the people and then only this uh, guidelines will really help. We are trying to include some guideline, but that won't help by itself. 
unless you don't have baseline knowledge, uh, unless you have baseline knowledge, you, you will not be able to successfully understand all the issues involved therein. Uh, in the in the I guess Q that's uh, did I in, miss any? Yeah, in the Q and A box, uh, one uh, Sri Ravinder Bhatnagar has mentioned. What time? What time is that? Ten fifty four. Ten fifty four. Q and A box, not the chat box. Uh, ten fifty four. Ha, uh, sir. Uh, you need to click on the triple dot. And Ravindra, but now eleven fourteen. I got it at that. Okay, okay. Many local bodies are insisting on making still structure. That question. Okay, even this is important. Okay, please. please. Uh, to provide uh, parking spaces, but shear walls are absent in these structures. I thought okay. I answered this. Uh, that is local bodies. That is uh, that is answer 1054 from Ravi the Bhatnagar. Do we have any program for separate dam safety course for earthquake and disaster management in cyclone, etc.? Mm. Dam safety course. What time is this? What time? 1054. Sir, that you can find in the Q and A box. Oh, in the Q and A box. It is the Q and A session. Oh, oh, oh. that's another one. In your chat, yeah. Mm, okay. Q and A box uh, 1054, you are saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First question from Ravindra Bhatnagarji. Uh, 1054, I don't have that question. Yeah. So this is what I am. I'm, I'm reading it out here, sir. Or I will also share my screen in, in the meeting. There's one question on uh, skin reinforcement. 1893 part 1 2016 yeah. yes yeah can yes. you show this yeah this one do we uh, do we have any program for separate dam safety codes for earthquake and disaster management in cyclone etc uh, we are having uh, earthquake resistant design of dams uh, both concrete dams and earthen dams as part of cd 39 and it will have hazard uh, design and assessment and retrofit and the third one will be most useful for um, the new Dam Safety Act, which asks 5,500 dams to be checked every five years. So we are in a hurry to create that document. We hope that we can get it out soon. Yeah. Recent question at uh, 1318 from Mr. Sai Sudhir. When damage is allowed in seismic design, should crack with be checked for seismic case in serviceability limit state? And allowed in seismic design should crack with be checked in seismic case in serviceability ministries. Uh, answer is no, uh, that is a different issue. Uh, when you're talking about uh, seismic damage, that is at higher level of shaking and serviceability is a different level of shaking. So you will do the serviceability as you would do traditionally. That will require a lower level of earthquake shaking and that you will do without any hesitation. Those are different from safety checks. So serviceability calculations as before, no change in them uh, on, in terms of strength issue. Yes, when you have damage, uh, we don't talk about cracks. Uh, one Mr. Danish Ali has requested, uh, I mean, uh, his query is regarding RMC and its quality. We have IS 4926, which talks about code of practice for RMC. And not only that, based on this 4926 and the provisions of ISO, 9001 BS has started one process certification scheme as per which there are uh, RMC suppliers who will, who are uh, registered or who are licensed with BIS and will be delivering you not only concrete as per 4926 but they have this quality I mean 9001 certification also uh, there are uh, option for other RMC players to take uh, to come into this umbrella anyway this is not directly related but uh, having uh, Raised, I have tried to answer. Is there any effort for code on lightweight concrete structures? Yeah. 9142 is the standard for aggregates which are light in weights. And uh, concretes made out of uh, such aggregates come under this category, which is also covered in uh, this uh, NBC part 6 section 5A as well as in 456. Yeah, but I'll add to what Arun has said. Uh, for structural applications, the performance of lightweight concrete is radically different from performance of normal weight aggregate and hence we will have to redo entire r d before we uh, use that as structural applications uh, especially moment uh, stress strain relations and then thereby 
um, you know, PM interaction diagrams and so on. And shear strength is much different. Even in self-compacting concrete, shear strength is much different. So there are a number of new materials coming in, uh, but without, uh, you know, hesitating, we should do a detailed R&D before we propose clauses for them. One Mr. Satish Yadav. Sir, Pan, sir, you may have to unmute, I think. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Just what you mentioned is uh, IS9142 is on aggregates, alternate aggregates, uh, alternate to IS383, which has 9142 uh, part 1 as lightweight uh, aggregate, part 2 lightweight centered fly ash aggregate, of course, for which we have also have a licensee also now. So if we use this lightweight centered fly ash aggregate, what we can make is lightweight concrete blocks. So lightweight, the concrete, and then uh, the, those blocks as infill walls can be used. Yes. So for using in, infill wall, you have a wide variety from all types of clay products and burnt clay bricks or perforated clay bricks or hollow clay bricks. And you have this 2185 series of standards Part one is solid concrete and uh, as well as hollow concrete. Part two is lightweight concrete. Lightweight concrete is defined uh, concrete blocks, which is defined as one using the lightweight centered fly ash aggregate as per 9142 part two. So and and then you have autoclave aerated cellular concrete blocks, part three. And 218Y part four is preformed formed concrete blocks. All these are available with the BIA certification, ISI marked, and these are being used particularly in green building concept, you know, these, because these uh, use substantial amount of fly ash also. So this is the limited, uh, this thing, uh, lightweight, uh, you know, uh, making things light, you know, the dead load being uh, reduced. Uh, that is the, and what uh, Professor Murthy has mentioned, the entire structural component to be used as lightweight concrete and for which we require an R&D before we proceed with codel provisions. Yeah. And then there are, uh, we are receiving good feedbacks uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, uh, the quality of presentation also, thanks to each one of those commenters. And uh, there are queries that we should also tie up with uh, local public authorities, which we have been doing right after NBC 2016. And uh, during this uh, pandemic time, we have been doing it on a webinar mode. Maybe now is the time we may uh, switch over and address a couple of such uh, events also in physical mode. Thank you for that suggestion. And one last question has come. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's 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 about one thirty. I think we should stop at some point now. Mm -hmm. It's about IS one eight nine three part, part one four. and part four. So which we have mentioned. I mean, uh, uh, chairman also mentioned Professor Moti sir, the chairman of CD thirteen also mentioned that the part four has also been taken up for revision. And uh, you all you already heard about revision of part one along with the probable six seismic hazard map. Remaining parts are will also be taken up for revision. Kindly be in touch with the BAS and they keep visiting our uh, Manak online portal wherein you will have an opportunity to see directly what are the draft standards. And in any case, because you have registered for the event today, we will put you in our mailing list and we will be sharing our updates, whatever is happening in the field of civil engineering from BIS. And uh, looking at the amount of feedback, I believe, sir, we may have to have a couple of uh, more uh, such events on yes. this particular theme. And maybe I would uh, take this as an opportunity to the speakers present here uh, to uh, share uh, their time or for some more uh, events. Sir. And I also request uh, now that all the participants, particularly the youngsters and those who are doing their academy or research particularly, can we try to take up topics of relevance to the revision of Indian standards or new Indian standards? That is always a welcome step. And uh, in case your uh, research inputs are, uh, I mean, in case you do, you have completed your uh, such a uh, thesis or uh, research work or on experimental basis, those can be thought of shared, sharing to the BA so that we can get it examined thoroughly and we can. Uh, Make use of the, make use them in uh, making new Indian standards or revision of uh, Indian standards as well. Any other closing thought from other uh, speakers of today, uh, including uh, Sri Varik Sab and uh, Professor Payne Krishna Ji and uh, Muthi Sab, as well as uh, Professor Anbarvin Ji? 
And uh, then I would request uh, Sri Sanjay Pansa, the standardization in Bureau of Indian Standards to uh, give his remarks uh, before we formally ask for the vote of thanks. Yeah, my only request to all the participants is that I understand some of the questions we have answered now and some we have not answered. Please do send it to BIS directly and we will consider it in our uh, appropriate sectional committees and uh, uh, you will be able to see the reflection of that in the newer revisions of the standard. Thank you so much once again. So from my side, I would request uh, the maintenance of fire protection systems made available in various occupancies, maybe residential, office or factory, whatever it may be. Please ensure that they are in the good working condition. So at the given time, that can be utilized to save the property and life. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity. Uh, I would only say that uh, some questions have been asked and uh, more questions will arise, I think, in the minds of the participants. So yes. I'll request, please feel free to send those questions in to the BIS, as has been mentioned, and we'll try to not only take note of them, answer them to the best of our abilities. <clears throat> And sir, please unmute your uh, laptop. And Balgan sir, please uh, unmute yourself, sir. Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> Thank no, you no. very much. We had a very nice interaction. And then, and then it was very good participation by the participants also. And of course, uh, we had a very interesting interaction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, fun, sir. Uh, yeah. I I would like to see what I uh, usually say in all the events and uh, we have a large uh, base of professionals in the country and some are quite young, some are experienced, some are veterans and uh, uh, we should look at the code this, as, the, as, the, uh, uh, as the compliable provisions which are there but they can always do some ingenuity with the provisions ultimately objective is safety and uh, and therefore they should use the code to to enhance safety rather than uh, any attempt to escape safety through the provisions of the code so provisions of the code are to be meant to supplement the individual like this is like you know uh, like uh, a surgeon who would always like their uh, patient to be safer and do the in, in, in put his best efforts when he does uh, whatever purpose and whatever education he has got objective is safety therefore even if you if you have any dilemma on the provision of the code please go for the safer side that is number one secondly uh, based on the experience that you have i would suggest that we have so many professional institutions now available in the country uh, organizations, the associations uh, and federations, they are there and uh, all should have one standardization cell. They should uh, consider, debate standards, uh, think of the newer standards wherever there is a gap they, and then as a consolidated effort, they should come to BIS and uh, so that uh, no, they will also start debating them th themselves, uh, first of all and they will learn in the process. So technical, these institutions, whether it is any association of consulting civil engineers, Indian Association of Structural Engineers, Indian Concrete Institutes, and various other institutional engineers, all of them should have a standardization cell uh, within them, and they should debate, or whatever, why, whatever name they would like this body to be called, a technical body. They should debate. They should become a real technical bodies. And then they represent their thoughts, well, uh, uh, well coordinated thoughts to BIS, and that will uh, that will bring. And second, third thing is that we should get into habit of writing, and uh, we uh, we are doing a lot of work. We are doing a lot of design execution uh, throughout the country. The difference I have seen for in what is happening in our country and elsewhere abroad is that there is a huge amount of documentation is happening. And therefore, it is good that you know, whatever experience you gather during your designing, during your execution, during your maintenance and repairs and retrofitting, you should start uh, uh, documenting that properly in the for, uh, for, form of you know, a book maybe or an article or even in the form of probable possible uh, codal provision. So that's my 
suggestions to everybody and thanks for participation especially the speakers i am grateful to them for having uh, you now agreed and joined and blessed all of us thank you sir thank you thank you thank you thank, thank, you, thank you very much thank you very much uh, fun sir uh, formally on behalf of bureau of indian standards uh, i and myself myself and my colleague jitendra kumar choudhury uh, extend a formal uh, uh, thanks to each one of you particularly the speakers as well as the audience uh, who have been patiently uh, listening and then interacting through their queries and chats and suggestions to bias we have uh, we have taken note of all these and as uh, already mentioned by uh, so, Prem Krishna, Krishna sir, we will be addressing uh, them in the remainder of the activities in our standards formulation also. And uh, please be in touch with uh, the BIS. And as I mentioned in, uh, in my last slide, CED at rate BIS.gov.in is our email ID, and manakonline.in is the portal, e governance portal of Bureau of Indian Standards, where all our activities uh, have been. Uh, our have all the our activities are shared. This is for information, and um, I hope to meet you all soon in the near future in some other event. And uh, formally, once again, I thank each one of you for spending your available time uh, and making it making this event a very successful one. Please, thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, thank you, sir, everyone, thank for you. sharing your time. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. streaming of the plane. Let me just take the last few questions. Copy paste at your channel. Participation certificate. <laughs> Who is asking for this? Those are the BB. When did we say that? Uh, Paisa Lekhi Karimi to will give certificate. <laughs> they are thinking like the seminar. Mm. Uh, when we go and they give the participation. Yes, and all presenters for the excellent presentation. Great session by Sean of Mitra. Mm. Very good. Catherine, closing? Mm. Copy pasting. Ah, done. Here we are. Yeah, we are done. हाँ सर वो मैं एक मिनट मेल करने से आपने नहीं नहीं टाइम नहीं है ना यहाँ पे सर स्टॉप लाइव स्ट्रीमिंग हाँ हाँ